Hey everyone, in this video, I want to dive into private link, understanding what private link is, why I might use it, and what are private endpoints, what is this private link service, and how they relate to each other. As always, if this is useful, please like, subscribe, comment, and share, and hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. I wanna focus on why we would use private endpoints. And firstly, let's think about what we might wanna be talking to. So if I think about Azure, I might wanna be talking to some kind of PaaS service. Now, by this, I might mean something like a particular storage account. It could be SQL, Postgres. There's a huge number of services that actually support private link. And I'm gonna talk more about those. So it could be some Azure provided service or it might be, well, I have my own service. I have multiple instances of my resource that I've put behind a load balancer to make it highly available and scalable. This could be an internal, it could be an external, but I have some service behind a load balancer that I want to expose. And these are what we're gonna focus on for exposing via private link, or particularly a private endpoint. Let's start with the scenario of a PaaS service, because it's, it's the simpler one. Now, if I think about a regular PaaS service, it's generally exposed via a public IP. So different instances will have different public IPs, but there is a public IP here. Now, I can do things to lock that down, and we're gonna talk about that there is, for example, a firewall configuration on most of these services. So there is a firewall configuration fronting these, which is really focused on the public facing IP that I could restrict to certain IP addresses and other things. One of the things I can actually do is if I think about, well, maybe I have a virtual network. So I have this virtual network in Azure. So we kind of draw out this idea. And remember a subnet is broken down into multiple subnets. So if right now I just think about, I have three subnets, we'll say subnet one, two, and three. And one of the constructs I can use is something called a service endpoint. So what a service endpoint lets me do is I can say this particular subnet here, I'm gonna enable for service endpoint storage. I can tell it the types of service I want to enable. What that enables me to do is on this firewall now, I can not only restrict it to certain public facing IP addresses, I can now also say, hey, for that particular subnet, I'm gonna allow that traffic through. So this is a configuration at the PaaS side saying, don't allow any traffic through unless it's coming from this subnet. Now one of the challenges of this approach with the service endpoint, it's great for things that live in that subnet, but it doesn't apply to things that maybe are connected to it. It wouldn't work if I'm in other subnets. If I was connected through express route private peering or a site to site VPN or a point to site, I, I wouldn't be able to use this. So it's only for things directly in there. And it's really about, hey, I'm restricting it via this firewall, but that public IP address still sits there. So maybe I'm not super keen on that. I want the idea that actually I want a true private address that represents a specific instance of a service. And that's exactly what private endpoints do. So a private endpoint is gonna create a read-only network interface in a subnet I pick it will then get an IP address from that subnet that represents a particular instance of the service. So if I take the idea of storage, now storage actually has different types of service available to it. I can think storage has, for example, blob, it has files, it has data lake, it has queues tables, but we're gonna just focus on those two. So what I can do with a private endpoint is I can actually say, okay, I'm gonna create a private endpoint in subnet three. So I create this private endpoint. I'm writing private endpoint one, it would be a specific IP address. 
and that points to the blob service of this particular storage account. Now, once I've done that, I could restrict now that service to not allow any access to the public IP address. I can basically lock that down. I could go into the properties of the firewall and say, only allow access from these selected networks and not put anything. And I'll, I'll show that in a second. So I can basically lock that down to just that. Now I can create multiple private endpoints for the same service. If I had, for example, another virtual network, let's draw one over here. So that's another VNet. Absolutely exactly the same way, I could create a private endpoint over here. And it can point to that same instance of the service. Because I might have some service I want to use from different virtual networks. So I can completely do that. I can have multiple private endpoints to the same instance of a service. So I might have multiple VNets want to use it that aren't connected. This is not some special subnet. I'm not having to delegate it to private endpoint or private link service. This literally is just a network interface class. It's a read-only network interface gets created in the subnet I specify, and then it uses up an IP address. I can coexist with other workloads. I can have regular VMs in here or really anything else. So let's have a quick look at that. And just to kind of stress the point, I can have multiple PEs in the same subnet. For example, maybe I also want to use files. So I'd have a different PE. Maybe there's a Postgres database. I'd have a PE to that as well. So I can break up all of these different things. So let's just dive into the very basics about that kind of private endpoint. So we jump over to the portal for a second. Now, what I have done on this one is I've actually configured some private endpoints on one of my storage accounts. So if I jump over to looking at the storage accounts, and we can see I've got this one called private link demo. You can probably guess what I'm doing on this one. And from here, we can go and look at the networking. <clears throat> now, I want to pay attention to a couple of different things. Firstly, just on the basic firewalls and virtual network, I've selected this option of selected networks only, but I have not added anything. So this is an optional step you can do once you've started to add private endpoints. And what this will allow is only to connect via private endpoints. That public IP is now essentially shut off. So I've not added any networks or IP addresses to be able to go via that public IP. And then what you do is you add private endpoint connections. Now you notice I actually have three different private endpoints. Adding a private endpoint is very simple. You give it an instance name. So this is the name of the private endpoint. Now this private endpoint I'm going to want to create in the region of where the target virtual network is. It doesn't have to be in the same region of where the service is. I can cross regions. And I'm going to talk more about that. But the name, I could just say Pride Link 10. I want something a bit better than that. But I would select a region of where the virtual network is. The private endpoint has to be in the same region as the VNet I'm going to create it in. Then, you're going to actually select, well, what service do I want to create this private endpoint to? Because I triggered this from the storage account, it's already kind of filled in this particular storage account. And here I can say, well, which service do I want to expose? And then I'm going to tell it, well, which virtual network? And it's only going to show me virtual networks in the same region of where I create the private endpoint, in my case, South Central. So then I could select a particular virtual network. And then from there, I could pick a subnet. I can also optionally integrate with private DNS. Now, I'm not going to jump into that right now. We're going to cover that later on. But that would enable me to actually have the complete name resolution. And I would go ahead and complete this creation. So all of that would create a private endpoint. As we saw, I have three of them to various different networks. So what does it actually look like on the network? So if I jump over and actually look at my basic virtual network that I created two of these in, so 
we jump over to our virtual networks, I'll look at my basic infrastructure VNet. If I scroll all the way down to the bottom, I created them in this infra subnet. And look what we see. I created two private endpoints, one for blob, one for files. We see two network interfaces, again, that are read-only, and they're being used by the private link service. So these are private endpoints that are pointing to, in this case, a private link service that's being provided by the Azure PaaS. I don't see it, I don't have to worry about it, it's just done for me. That means this instance of the service is now represented by these IP addresses. So by talking to 10.0.1.13, I can actually go and talk to that service. Now to prove this is actually working, let's go back to that storage account. Remember, I locked down regular public access. If I now go to the blob service, I can see there's a container. If I select it, it fails. It's failing because I'm not on a virtual network that has access to that private endpoint IP address, which means I have no access. I cannot get to it. If I switch over to a virtual machine, now this virtual machine right here is on a virtual network that has access to it. If I go and look at the storage account, and we'll see exactly the same ones again, and I'll go and look at the containers again, this time, I can. I'm the same account, it's just because now I'm accessing that particular instance of the storage account through a different network path. I'm not trying to talk to its public IP, which blocks everything. I'm now talking to it through that private endpoint IP. And that's the key point, and it is just an IP address, which gives me a lot of flexibility. Now I mentioned it doesn't have to be in the same region, subscription, even Azure AD tenant. So when I'm creating these private endpoints, it can actually be different subscription, region, even Azure AD tenant. And there's a whole authorization flow to be able to connect if I don't have the permissions on the service I'm actually trying to connect to. But this gives me a lot of flexibility that now I can go and use these private endpoints. Let's just stress the fact that this is for private endpoints. I really can go and create these anywhere I want to be able to use them. It gives me a lot of flexibility. If I think about using these, it's just an IP address. And that actually gives me a lot of flexibility. This PE is an IP address in a certain virtual network. But if, for example, I have maybe an on-premises location, if I'm on-premises down here, and I'm connecting to this virtual network, this could be express route, private peering, or it could be a site-to-site -site VPN, could even be a uh, point to site VPN, I'm connected to it. It doesn't matter. I will actually be able to talk to the private endpoints and get access to the services. If I was another virtual network, let's say I'm over here, and I'm peered, well, guess what? Once again, it's just an IP address. I'm just talking to an IP. I'd be able to use it and get to the service. So this is really powerful. Now my PaaS services, I can leverage really through anything I want. This gives me very easy access to services over a private connection, as long as there's some path to the IP address. When I think about the flexibility, I showed you creating a private endpoint from um, the service itself, but it's actually a private link center. So if I just search for private link here, so we have this private link center. 
Here I have the private endpoints that are created. I can see any private link services I have, which we're gonna come back to. But this is what would give me the ability to say, hey, I wanna go and add a private endpoint. Now again, I'm showing the portal, but I could absolutely do this through ARM templates and CLI, all those great things. I do exactly the same things again. This is how I could easily go and create private endpoints. Actually, stick, make sure I've got a virtual network somewhere. We'll do South Central again. This is the target resource. So notice here, the portal lets me browse, hey, to anything in my Azure AD directory. I could select different subscriptions, different resource types, or if maybe it's not in my directory and I can't browse it, I can actually select resource ID or alias. Resource ID is obviously, we, we have a resource ID for every single type of object in Azure. So I could actually, as long as I know that resource ID, I could put it in here. Or there's something called an alias, which is really important for private link services, which we'll talk about when we deal with private link services. But I can leverage that as well. If I went back to my storage accounts, we can always see our resource ID. If I go and look, let's try endpoints. So there's my resource ID. So it's that top one right here. So if I shared this with someone, they would be able to now use that, paste that in. If they had permissions on this object, it would just go and create. If not, well, within that private link center, I'd see pending connections and I could go and approve it and then it would complete and actually get created. So there's a whole different set of flows that I can leverage. When I think about which type of resources support private link, it's huge now. Any service that maybe doesn't directly integrate with a virtual network, typically now there is the option to create a private endpoint for. So we have things like Azure Automation, Cosmos DB, container registries, you name it. Most of these have private endpoints. So I can go and get to that service. That's the point of these. A private endpoint is getting to the service. Most of them now have this action. This is really becoming the default. Today, but this is changing, so I wanna kind of stress this point. Today, private endpoints are not impacted by things like network security groups or user-defined routes. It is in preview right now. So right now on the subnet, there is a setting private endpoint network policies. If I enable it, then again in preview, then NSGs, UDRs would impact the private endpoints. But GA functionality at this time is they would not take effect, but you can go and change that if you wanna go and sign up for the preview and that's gonna change in time. So great, they're just an IP address on my virtual network that represents a particular instance of a service. Again, if I had a second storage account, it'd be different private endpoints or Postgres or SQL or anything else. But it allows me to turn off the public IP, access it just through a private IP, and because it's an IP, any connected network can leverage it as well. One of the big things that comes up is disaster recovery for these, because obviously they, they exist in a certain virtual network. What if there's a region failure? Now obviously, if the service is in the same region as the private endpoint, the service is not gonna be available either. But imagine it's something like a storage account that has GRS, so it's replicated to another region. Well, what I would do in that point is I would have a private endpoint to the storage account in another virtual network. Now it's probably gonna be a different IP address, but what would actually happen is if this storage account failed over to the paired region, the private endpoints will automatically update and go and now point to what is now the primary instance of the service. That's differently than if I have things like read access. If I have read access GRS, for example, on the storage, there's a different secondary private endpoint I can create to point to the replica. So that's a different option. But if I have a service that fails over to another region, the private endpoints, for example, with storage GRS, would automatically go and repoint to the new primary of that storage account. 
If the service maybe is not in the same region, but now I'm thinking about if this fails, well again, I can have different private endpoints in different virtual networks. And then maybe from my on-premises, for example, well, I would just have a different express route circuit, for example, that goes and connects to that virtual network. Now, there might be some DNS switching you're gonna do to make that work, but there are options for how I think about dealing with failures. If it's the region the service is in fails, or maybe it's the region where I have a private endpoint fails. But I can absolutely, as we talked about, have different private endpoints in different virtual networks across different regions to the same service. So there's a lot of balancing I can do with that. Now I mentioned DNS, and DNS is super important to all of this actually working. Because most of the time services we connect to is over an encrypted connection. When I talk to storage, let's say over REST APIs, it's encrypted. There are certificates on this that is validated when I do that encrypted connection. If I try to just connect with an IP address, the certificate won't match. The certificate is for the name of the service. If we go and look at the services for a second, let's look at my storage account again. Remember we had those endpoints. So if we go back again and look at all of the endpoints, we have this name. So right here, for example, for blob, it's the name of the storage account, dot service, dot core, dot windows, dot net. So we look that up and that resolves to the service. Now by default, that's gonna resolve to that public name. So if we take that as an example, so DNS is everything. So if I jump over and I think about that name again for a second. So if I think, okay, from a DNS perspective, that SAPRIV, I'm gonna get the name wrong, SAPRIV link demo SCUS. And then remember we had the service name. So we had the dot blob dot core, dot windows, huge name. This is why we'd use, use the short part. So this big name. Now today, that resolves to the IP address. That resolves to that public IP. So it's just pointing to that. Because this is all in a public DNS zone that Microsoft host. When I turn on private link, something interesting happens. So when I activate private link, this, well, it becomes an alias record. This now becomes a C name that now points to exactly the same name. So the S, A, Priv, etc. private link. blob, dot core, et cetera, et cetera. So I turn on private endpoint for a service, it changes the DNS name that used to point to the public IP to now point to this private link child zone. Now what it does to make sure st things still function is in the public DNS zone, this record, well, it still points to the public IP. So I can still use the service publicly. But what I'm actually gonna do is privately, so if I think about a private zone, I want a record that for this name doesn't resolve to the public IP. I want that name to resolve to the private IP. That's the key point. That's what's gonna make this work. So now if I'm on a network that has this private DNS zone resolution, when I go and look up saprivlinkdemo.blob.core, it's gonna to resolve to an alias, and then I have a record for that alias 
that points to the private IP. So now the name still works. It's the full name, but it actually now resolves to that private endpoint IP address. So that DNS is everything. So really that makes sense. Ordinarily, the DNS record for a service just points to the public IP. I want it to point to the private IP. So now we're gonna have a private link variant that that public one will point to that I will have pointing to the private IP. Azure will still add a record on the public DNS, so this name still works and points to the public IP, but I can override it by having a private zone, private DNS in my virtual network that's now gonna to point to that private endpoint IP. That's the key point that's really gonna power this and make this work. Now we can see this in action. So let's go and look at DNS for a second. So what I'll actually start with is I'm gonna look at a regular storage account. So if I just take a regular NS lookup, and let's go and look at this. So this is a regular NS lookup of a storage account. And what we can see a regular one basically does is, okay, I was looking for this name and what it resolves to is the name of the storage cluster, which resolves to the public IP address. Notice there's no hint of a private link or anything else. So remember, I'm on a network that doesn't have any private endpoints or anything special anyway. So this is a regular storage account. This is what we'd see for anything else. Now let's go and look at a storage account that I have enabled a private endpoint for. So we're gonna run exactly the same command but just change the storage account. So if we go and look at it now, well, it's a little bit different. I'm asking the same question. Hey, tell me who this storage account is. But now what it resolves to is look, this special private link variant version. SA privlink demo scus.privatelink.blob.core.windows.net. Now, because I'm at in the public DNS, it created a private link record for me that still points to that storage cluster. That means that if I'm on a network that doesn't have private endpoints, hey, I can still go and get to the back end service. It doesn't break. So that's kind of the key point. But it's added that private link alias now from the main record. What happens if we now look at that on a network that does have the private endpoint? So if we jump over to this machine, remember this is actually sitting on that virtual network. If I do exactly the same lookup, it actually looks different now. This time, I'm asking it the same question. Hey, tell me that public name. It resolves, once again, it's an alias to the private link variant but I actually have a record for the private link name in my DNS that points to that private endpoint IP address. Now, when I ask to talk to, hey, SA privilink demo dot blob dot core dot windows dot net, it points to the private link variant and then I have a record for that private link alias. So that's why on the networks, that works we have that private link variation of the zone to enable, hey, I can use the regular name still, so any encryption or anything else is still gonna work just fine. But now I'm using that private endpoint IP address as if by magic. Now there are different options for hosting that record. I keep using the term kind of private DNS and that, by that I mean a zone that is not on the internet. It's on some private DNS fabric. I can absolutely use Azure private DNS zones. And there's an integration for the PaaS services that will actually go and create the record for me. If I think about, I'll create an Azure private DNS zone. So we'll have Azure private DNS. In this case, the zone I want is that private link dot blob dot 
dot windows dot net. That's the zone I need created because in that I'm going to create a record. Now it's an address record, so it's an A record that's going to be the name of the storage account. So let's say storage account one, and it's going to resolve in my case, because this is for blob, to that IP address, P1. So I can use a private DNS zone. And what I then do is on that virtual network, I link the VNet to that zone for resolution purposes. So there's different ways I can link to private Azure DNS zones. I have a whole video on Azure DNS, but I want it for resolution purposes. Remember, if I had other VNets that were peered that wanted to use the same private endpoints, they need that consistent DNS resolution as well. So what do I do? I link them to the same zone. So that is also linked for resolution. A single private zone, I think, is a thousand different virtual networks can be connected to it for resolution purposes. So I can have loads of different VNets Maybe this is a hub with all the private endpoints. Lots of spokes using those private endpoints. They just need consistent DNS resolution for this zone. They could all connect to the same one. So that's a very, very common pattern. Some companies won't use the private link variant. Now you may actually say for a second, you could step back. Why do we bother with this private link? What's the point? If the regular name is something.blob.core.windows.net, why not forget about all this alias stuff to private link? Seems overly complicated. If I have a local DNS zone of a name, it will always override something on the public DNS. So why am I bothering with this private link? Why don't I on my DNS just create blob.core.windows.net add a record for SA1 pointing to PE1. And that would totally work. But what happens when I try and now talk to storage account two? Storage account two is not using private endpoints. It's just the regular public. I have no entry for storage account two. But I've created this blob.core.windows.net, which is now authoritative for the zone, so it won't find a match and it will fail to connect. So we use the private link variant because now I can be authoritative for that zone, the private link, which will only get used if private endpoints are enabled, but for regular storage accounts, that's the blob.core.windows.net, which is still an internet DNS zone. I'm not overriding in any way. So that's why we have that. Now there are ways to just use blob.core.windows.net. There are some companies that use things like response policy zones, which are individual entries. So it's a more complicated solution, but they do just create sa1.blob.core.windows.net. But because of this RPZ, the response policy zone, if it doesn't find an exact match for the fully qualified domain name, then it does go and look at the internet. Basically saves you a step. It removes the lookup to the alias and then the alias to the IP address. So it's a slight efficiency thing. But for most companies, they are not going to do that. The documentation will recommend create a private link zone and do the DNS that way. When I create a private endpoint to a PaaS service, you probably remember in the portal, it gave me that option for, hey, do you want to use Azure DNS? If I jump over and we run for that one more time, just so you can see that. If we go, it really doesn't matter. Let's actually, we go and do the private link version. So if I go to my private endpoints and add a private endpoint, remember none of this stuff is really that important. I just need it in the private endpoint. Remember, it has to be the same region as the VNet that I'm creating the private endpoint in. It can be a different region from the resource it's going to point to. But if I now see all these different services, all of these things support private endpoints. But if I do storage account for a second, and then I'll pick my one that does the private link. And again, we'll do blob. One of the configuration options you have down here at the bottom 
is this integrate with private DNS. And what this will do for me is it will create the record automatically and set it to the right IP address that the private endpoint is gonna create. So notice what it's done here is given me a configuration name and it's saying this is the zone. So it's that private link.blob.core.windows.net. So it will go and do the work for me. So using the Azure Private DNS is super easy. And remember the big point of this is a private link zone is really available anywhere. So if I do have other virtual networks that appear to it that want to use the private endpoint, I would link them to that same instance of the Azure Private DNS zone so they get consistent name resolution. Technically, you wouldn't have to. You could have a different instance of the same name, private link.blob.core.windows.net. You just then have to add the same records into it. So unless there's some real reason against it, uh, I probably wouldn't bother doing that. You don't have to use Azure Private DNS. Maybe in my virtual network, what I'm actually doing is I'm using my own custom DNS. Maybe I've got Active Directory running and I've got custom DNS configured that points to my domain controllers, my own DNS. Well, that, that's not a problem at all. In my custom DNS, I would add the same thing. So in my custom DNS solution, there's really two different options. One is, hey, I create in my DNS, I create that private link dot blob, etc., and I add a record, an address record for storage account one, pointing to that private endpoint IP address. 10.0.1.4, whatever that was. And that will work. They might use the same DNS service, it's replicated. I just have to have the resolution. Another option, if I don't wanna do that, and I wanna use the Azure Private DNS Zone, well, I can't talk to Azure Private DNS from on-premises. It's this special IP address, I think it's 168.63.129.16, that will not work outside of Azure. What you could set up is a DNS forwarder. And I have an Azure DNS video where I go into all details about this. But the other option, instead of adding the records, is you could say, look, for private link.blob.core.windows.net, I actually want you to forward to my DNS forwarder. And because my DNS forwarder lives in a virtual network, it can then forward it to 168.63.129.16 which means it now uses the Azure Private DNS Zone. So again, I'm getting consistent DNS resolution. That's the key point of really all of this. That, that's what I'm trying to achieve. So that's the importance of DNS. Hopefully that makes sense why we're doing that. It gives us that name resolution of the regular name to point to the private endpoint address. So if there was any kind of encryption, certificates, I'm using the regular name. So it's still gonna pass the check on the certificate, but it makes it point to my private endpoint IP address. So far, we have talked all about built-in Azure PaaS services and using those private endpoints, which is a very common scenario. But what about if I have my own service? What about if now we have this scenario? We have this scenario right here. So I have my service right there that lives in its own virtual network. So this is VNet4 or something. I've lost track of the names I've done. But we have our own service. I wanna offer this to other virtual networks. The typical easy answer to this would be, hey, this is an internal load balancer. Peer the network. Just peer it. Peer it to all of the networks that want to use it. And then they can just use that internal IP address. And that's a common answer. But maybe I can't. Maybe I can't peer it. Maybe the IP address range I'm using here overlaps with the IP address I'm using there. If the IP address ranges overlap, I can't peer them. Maybe this service is not really part of my company. Maybe this service is some kind of provider that wants to offer this to many, many different customers. I don't want to peer networks with someone I don't really know. I just want to be able to consume this particular instance of a service. So it could be, hey, I can't peer them because the IP addresses overlap, so I need to do network address translation, 
or I don't want to peer them because I, we don't have that kind of relationship. I don't, I don't want to directly connect the IP spaces. I just want to consume this particular service. That's where private link service, PLS, comes in. So let's dive into the private link service. What color should we use for private link service? I don't know. We'll use, yeah, we'll use the yellowy color. This load balancer, let's actually stretch a point. This is going to be a standard load balancer. It cannot be the basic skew. It has to be standard. A load balancer has multiple front end IP configurations. I can have lots of them, but let's say it's the first front end one configuration. Now that can be internal or external. Remember, a load balancer is of a certain type. All the front ends will be the same. It's either an internal or external load balancer. But I have this front end configuration. We're going to create a private link service. So I'm going to go ahead, try and draw the icon a little bit, kind of a chain. I'm creating a PLS service. That PLS service binds to a specific front end configuration on a particular load balancer. It's going to provide that network address translation. Now, if you think about network address translation, it's, hey, there's some IP talking to me. I'm going to basically convert that to an IP address I manage, and that's what the service is actually going to see. So I need to use a certain port to map it to what that target real IP address was and the destination I'm talking to. So we need some IP addresses for the private link service to perform that NAT. So we're going to give it at least one IP it can use. Now I can actually have multiple, I can have eight maximum. The reason we might want multiple ones is simply how many people are going to be talking to this service. We support a certain number of connections. If we think about the flow, well, it's basically 64,000 per connection. And a connection is defined as the NAT IP and the resource on the back end of the load balancer IP. So it's that resource IP. So I can actually scale the private link service in different ways. So again, this resource actually has, hey, I've got IP1, I've got IP2. It just has to be a unique flow. So if I have one NAT IP, and one back end, hey, there's 64,000 I can support. But if I have two back ends, suddenly it's 64,000 times two. If I had two NAT IP addresses, well, now it's 64,000 times two times two. So you can see it actually scales really, really well. I can scale private link service by adding NAT IPs up to eight or adding resources behind the load balancer. But each connection, each unique port coming in, is going to consume one out of the 64,000 per NAT IP and resource IP uh, combinations. The private link service has to be in the same region as the virtual network. It's being created within there. And so we're going to give it, when we do this configuration, we give the private link service a subnet. And it's that subnet that it's going to get these NAT IPs from. We can tell it, hey, we want you to just grab whatever IP is available in the subnet, or we can do a static configuration, use this particular IP. That might be useful if the service it's talking to only is going to accept traffic from certain IP addresses. Because realize what's happening here. What's happening here is these are the IPs that this service will think the traffic is originating from. This is what it's going to see as that incoming. So we have those different flow capabilities. If I need as the resource to see the true originator, there is the option to turn on a TCP proxy v2 header, which will encapsulate certain information about the originating connection. So then this could go and look at that information and get more information about where the packet actually originated from not just this NAT IP. It doesn't work for UDP. UDP, there's no way to add in those additional headers. And we can see that PLS configuration. So if I now jump over back to my private link center, we can see I have a private link service. 
So I created my private link service. I actually have a connection created. We'll talk more about that in a second. I have my NAT configuration. So it's bound to a particular subnet, which I specified when I created. I'm not using that TCP proxy v2, so I'm not encapsulating that. And I've added two IP addresses. I just did dynamic. But notice I could add additional ones. And I could say, hey, is it static or dynamic? So I can go ahead and add as many as I want up to eight, eight is the maximum I can do. If I just created a brand new private link service, you can get an idea of what we do on the configuration. So once again, we just pick something, just gonna do test. Remember, this has to be in the same region as the load balancer. So the private link service has to be the same region as the load balancer, and the load balancer will be the same region as the virtual network. So these are my outbound settings. So which load balancer do I want to actually connect to? So I could pick which of the front end IPs. They can only have one PLS per front end IP configuration. So I've used this one up already because I already have a private link service. If I picked a different load balancer, then I could see it's available front end IP that doesn't currently have a PLS. And now I can say which subnet do I want to use to get those NAT IP addresses from? I could turn on the TCP proxy, and then I can add multiple NAT IPs, again, up to eight. We then have the idea of access security. And this is all about, well, who is allowed to use me? So if we go to access security, oh, I have to pick something. I have control. So what I can say here is role-based access control only. So it's only gonna be available to people that have permissions to this private link service. Or I could say only certain subscriptions and I can add particular subscriptions. Or I could just say, hey look, anyone that has the alias of my service and I can even then add subscriptions that would be auto approved. Normally with PLS, I always have to manually approve them. Here, I could actually say, hey, look, for these subscriptions, just go ahead and automatically approve it. If I'm curious about which permissions, there's an article that talks about the exact permissions for private link, and I'm gonna link that in the article below, but it goes through each of the individual permissions. So if you wanna be more granular about what I actually want to give, well, I can do that through there. Now, you might be curious about what this alias thing is because I talked before, let's just close that, about the resource ID. So if I have a private link service, like my private link service right here, well, in its regular properties, we have the resource ID. Now, if we look at that resource ID, it has things like my subscription. If I'm a provider, I probably don't wanna share that with all my customers. And so notice you also have this other thing. You have this, alias, and it's a big old thing. It's the name of the private link service, it's a GUID, the region, and then just the standard suffix. But we have that available to us. So the whole point now is, if I am creating this service, and I wanna expose it to lots of different customers, I don't want to give them the resource ID, I'll give them the alias, which abstracts away the underlying resource ID, but it's globally unique. So now if I've set those access permissions on the PLS, anyone with that alias can say, go into Private Link Center, create a new private endpoint, say I have an alias, paste in that alias, and then it would go through that approval flow unless I added their subscriptions to be auto approved. And that's the whole point of this. Uh, what this ends up doing is I now get another private endpoint. So now I get private endpoint three that points to the private link service. And it's natted. So a huge part of this is network address translation. So these VNets could be using the same IP space, which is what I've actually set up in my environment. I'm using the same IP space and I'm using a different subscription, a different Azure AD tenant to actually connect these together. 
So if we go and look at my configuration, so what I actually did for this private link service is I'm using a load balancer. So if I go back to my uh, overview, I've got this load balancer over here. It's an internal standard load balancer that points to just a couple of web servers. And you can see the NAT IPs I'm using, this 10.0.1. So I'm using two IPs from this VNet Infra SCUS virtual network. So if I look at that VNet Infrastructure SCUS virtual network, I'm using basically 10.0 slash 16. If I then go to a different subscription and I look at its virtual networks, I have this VNet Infra SCUS network as well that is using exactly the same IP space, 10.0. But I wanna use that service, I wanna use that load balancer. So what we've done is in this subscription, we created a private endpoint to that service. So if we look, I have a private endpoint going to that particular private link service. Now what that looks like, once again, it's just an IP address. If I go and look at that virtual network, notice what I have. I have a network interface for that PE to internal private link service SCUS US. And it's just an IP address, 10.0.0.5. So technically, if we actually go to a virtual machine, this one right here, and let me go to this virtual machine, this is the one in the other subscription, go to our really advanced browser, it works. It's going over the private link service to that load balancer, but I'm connecting to it just fine. Even though it's an overlapping IP space, it doesn't matter, it's natting that traffic over. So that's really like a huge powerful feature of what we're getting here. Now I'm creating, I've got some service I have, I had a private link service, and it's just natting that traffic over. Now once again, I connected to the IP address because this was HTTP 80, it wasn't encrypted, so it didn't matter. But if this was encrypted, once again, this service probably has a name. Once again, I would need to get that consistent DNS resolution. I could absolutely create a private, Azure private DNS zone for whatever name I'm using over here and add that. I could add it to my custom DNS. It doesn't matter, but remember that same name resolution is probably going to apply again. I'm always gonna have those things. Uh, there are limits. There's obviously we have our standard Azure subscription limits page. And if we look at the networking limits, we can scroll down. One interesting thing is if you look at the load balancer, load balancer supports 600 front end IP configurations. We, we do not support 600 private link services to the same load balancer. I think again, it's eight. So it's a much smaller number there. And we'll see that actually, if we look at the private link, let's keep scrolling down. There is a private link section. There we go, private link. So number of private endpoints per virtual network is a thousand. Private endpoints per prescription, 64,000. PLS is per subscription, 800. Number of IP configurations on a private link service. So eight, so that was the number of net IP addresses. Number of private endpoints to the same private link service, 1,000. And you can see some other kind of numbers there, uh, DNS zones, etc. But they're, they're high numbers. Once again, a, a typical pattern would be absolutely yes, I could create PEs to every single like spoke VNet, or I can create the PEs to maybe a hub and just leverage that through peering. And there, there are pros and cons but I pay for peering traffic, I pay for traffic going over a private endpoint. So I think that that's actually a wash, but check, go use your calculator, you can check the exact numbers of that. But that is private link. Uh, I hope that was kind of useful. 
the whole point of this is for PaaS services, I don't have to use the public IP, I can completely shut it off. And now I just get an IP address within my virtual network that can be used by the virtual network, any peered virtual network or connected networks, sites like VPN, express route, private peering. I need to have consistent DNS. So I can have things like the Azure private DNS and link them for resolution to multiple VNets. For on-premises, either I create the private link variant zone and add the records, or I can configure that to forward to a DNS forwarder in the virtual network that then uses the 16863 blah, 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 to use Azure private DNS. For my own services, or maybe some other company wants to offer, I can attach a private link service to a standard load balancer, which will nap the traffic, and then add private endpoints. Once again, though, if it's encrypted, the name resolution will matter. So once again, I'm gonna have whatever this name is, I'll need to add records. The key point is private endpoints to PLS, it's not gonna do an automatic name configuration for you. You're gonna to have to go and create those records. And that's really it. So I hope that cleared up some things. The private endpoint is the read-only NIC that gets created and IP address in your network that points to a PaaS service or a private link service for a custom resource. Private link service is the ability to offer my service behind a standard load balancer to other virtual networks via a private endpoint. That's it. As always, a lot of work goes into this, so please do like and subscribe. Uh, but until next time, take care.